session. OK, so uh, I'm going to try and present in 20 minutes um, of a project that, that Doug mentioned. It's essentially a project that we started doing in 2005. It was a DFI-funded consortium. Um, and it's, uh, it was not just in, on Africa, but also in India. So we're going to try to present comparative work. And actually, this pro particular work that we started, I'm still trying to carry on this with this work in a new consortium, also funded by GFID, called Effective States Inclusive Developments and New Research Center in Manchester, University of Manchester. Um, so this, this presentation is really based on this book, which came out earlier this year, State Business Relations, Economic Development in Africa and India. It's a Routledge book, just probably came out a couple of months back. Um, so it's going to be based a lot on the book, but we have also now got lots of journal papers in different journals, World Development, JDS, JID. So if you're interested in some of the journal papers, you're most, you're most welcome to write to me and I'll, I'll send you those papers. So what do we try and do in the book is we try and address three core questions. The first question is what characterizes state business relations or effective state business relations and how have they evolved over time in Indian states and, 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 also, and also, as we'll see, across African sub, 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 sub and African countries, uh, countries over about 20, 25 years. And secondly, what are the implications of this for economic performance? Particularly as an economist, I would like to know is there any causal uh, role that this that effective service relations play, and can we isolate that, that particular role or effect from other factors that affect economic performance? And the final question we had to answer was, how do these relations emerge? I mean, what are the political factors that explain the provenance, and why is it we actually often see collusive uh, service relations that are not growth, growth enhancing persisting for quite a long time in many different countries? So this book, what we try to do in this project, actually, we brought in economists and political scientists, we use qualitative methods, we use, use qualitative methods, and we try to do sort of both case studies and also econometric work. And, and this, as I said, is based on this consortium. Uh, the website is still al alive. It's the, the consortium finished in 2010. It's, uh, and you can go and check the papers if you want to. Right, so uh, I think some of the st stuff only Dirk has talked about. I mean, we have to keep in mind, when you think about this work, there's been a lot of work already done, mostly by political scientists, who have, have argued for quite some time that collaborative relations between the state and, and the business sector can be growth enhancing. We know that, and this is something we, we use to think about a current project. And of course, the case studies have mostly come from East Asia. There was a lack of quantitative evidence of what these relations can do for growth. And so as, an econ as economists, we were interested in this sort of questions. And there was relatively less, less evidence uh, for African South Asia. That's changed a little bit, in, as Dirk mentioned, in the last, couple of, last few years. But really, when we started out in 2005, there wasn't much work on Africa and South Asia. Uh, just to be clear what we mean by effective SBRs, and I'm going to use SBRs in short, it's a set of highly institutionalized, by which we mean repeated interactions, repeated, repeated games, can happen through formal mechanisms, but can also can happen through informal mechanisms, so formal and informal institutions. So that's very important, number one. It has to be institutionalized, it cannot be one-off. It, doesn't make, it cannot be really a situation where it's a one-off game. It has to be repeated interactions. Secondly, it has to be responsive from both sides, both parties, the state and the private, and the, and the private sector. And third, it has to be, to some extent, to a large extent, public. Not all of it can happen behind closed doors. There has to be some kind of accountability and some transparency in this relationship, relations in the state of the business element. So that's what we mean by effective SPRs. And effective SPRs are more likely to be characterized by collaborative and synergistic relations with the state and the business element, by definition. And ineffective SBRs would be more, more likely to be characterized by collusive and trend-seeking relations in the state and the business elite. And that's sort of a way to think about this in a, in a simple way. Um, and again, Dirks mentioned this, transparency and information. This, of course, this, the principles of good SBRs come from the work by, by, um, by Donald Snyder and Chalmer Johnson and so on. So this is not, this is not our, our contribution. This is already there. Transparency and information. There has been some transparency information provided by the state to this private sector. Uh, in terms of policies and so on. Reciprocity in actions, we know that in the East Asian case, if the state is giving some credit subsidies to the private sector, they expect something in return, uh, expo exports, uh, exports, for example. Credibility in statements, it has to be uh, essentially fixing the credible commitment problem. The, the private, private sector has to believe the state and believe what the state is saying, is saying and doing will persist for some time. And trust, of course, has to be there between the two, the two different parties. And so you have to see an absence of collusive behavior between the, the state and the private sector. Um, how do state SBRs affect economic growth? And again, Dirk's talked about it, so I'm going to try and uh, go through this very quickly. Effective SBRs can help prevent both government failures and market failures. Uh, how do they prevent market failures? Well, they help solve information-related market and coordination failures. For example, business associations monitoring their members and ensuring compliance. That's a very standard way you can think through how good SBRs can help in growth. 
Um, also, peak and sectoral business associations that are active, independent of the state, and represent the private sector of the region can resolve into the collective action problems that are inherent in developing countries. Now, if I step back a little bit and just think about institutions and the literature institutions development, we think about the kind of two kind of dominant strands on that. One has been the argument that property rights are very important for development. This is the argument that Asimoglu, Robinson, and others have used. A second argument has been about transaction cost minimization of uh, functions of institutions. This is the Oliver Williamson argument, which is informed to a large extent the doing business reports of the World Bank. The way we see SBRs is as we see through a third function of institutions, which is coordination and solving, co and solving collecting action failures. We are not saying that you can't bring in transaction cost minimization or property rights within SBRs, but I think seeing, uh, seeing institutions and coordination failures as SBRs being, uh, helping resolve that is a very nice way of thinking about why SBRs matter purely from as an institutional form. How do they fail? So, sorry. So, ne so, next point would be government failure. So, essentially, as I said, the big issue here is that S SBRs can lead, can lead to credible commitment on the part of the government to certain policies that can minimize uncertainties on future policy actions in the investors. And the next, the next feature of this would be a creating an institutional environment where the private sector can demand high quality public goods from the states as infrastructure, effective public transportation, and secure property rights. And finally, Effective SBRs can provide check and balances, balance function of government tax expenditure policies uh, because you'd expect within good, within good SBRs, the government essentially trying out different uh, views on, on taxation and expenditure policies on the private sector who are saying to them, well, this makes sense, but this probably doesn't. So you'd expect some kind of a way, the calibration that happens within good SBRs that can provide a check and balance function of government, government tax and expenditure uh, policies. Now, to, to try and then, so the question of causal effect of SBR, that was a big thing we struggled with at the beginning of this, pro, of this, pro, of this program. So how can we actually actually be convinced, convincing other economists, perhaps more so than, than other social scientists, that SBRs matter for economic growth? And for that, we had to obviously, as we all, again, as in economics, we had to find a measure of effective SBRs. I mean, and here is where, you know, we, because we were essentially trying to develop a measure of SBRs, where we are not going to try and start doing a lot of primary, primary data collection, we had to go, pink, book, go back in time because we wanted to get a sense of how SBRs evolved in Africa and, 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 and in, in, in South Asia. So we essentially tried to try to find a measure that was time varying over time and across countries or regions, right? So we could, in that case also, purely methodologically, we could use panel data. It was very useful because as we know, there's been a lot of criticism of cross-country regressions in institutions and developing literature. And we wanted to avoid that. We had to define a measure which was based on observable features of effective SBRs because we are going back in time. So we're going back in time in, Af in African context, about 30 years, 40 years. We had to find what is something we can observe. So the properties were measured in most parts, it was objective and not subjective, not perceptions based, like the, go the governance measures, the Goff and Gray measures to some extent. We captured more the formal dimensions, less informal dimensions, that is the weakness of our measure. And we call it is a combination of both de jure institutions and de facto institutions. Because again, as you know, there's been a big debate about measurement that do you go for de jure or do you go for de facto? Our measure combines both de jure and de facto. So the four, the four dimensions we try to do, this is Jerk Williams pioneering work on this, on the, on this particular, uh, on the measurement of work. The first is how is the private sector organized vis-a-vis -vis the public sector? Is there an umbrella business association, for example? When was it formed? How active is it? And so on. Secondly, how is the government organized vis-a-vis -vis the private sector? Uh, is there an investment promotion agency? When was it formed? How active is it? And so on. Third was the relations, the interaction with the private and the public sector. How are state business relations practiced and institutionalized? Is there a joint economic council, for example? When was it instituted? How often does it meet? And so on. And finally, what mechanisms are there for the about is the harmful collusive behavior? Are the competition laws, when are they enacted, uh, and are they actually enforced? So in, India, uh, in, in Africa, we had uh, uh, Dirk did this uh, early, early work for us, where we measured SBRs for 19 African countries for about 30-odd 30, 30 years, so going all the way to 1970, used mostly de jure measures, mostly, as I said, due to consider data collection. There's nothing stopping us, if you want to do something work in the, work in the future, to use de facto measures and use perceptions-based approaches. There's nothing stopping us in this way. In India, we also went back for about uh, 20, 20, uh, 30, uh, 25 years to 1985 for 15 major states. Uh, in the Indian case, we had more time and we could do a little more in primary data collection, visited every, every state, and allowed us to bring in some de facto dimensions. 
So the African case, just to very quickly put up this plot, the group one of the countries which have been the fastest growing countries, this happens to be most, Botswana, Mauritius, Uganda, uh, Mozambique, and so on. So, and in, interestingly, if you can see in, in the African case, SBRs improved pretty much across this 19 countries, but the country that had the highest growth in the simple descriptive graph also had highest improvement in SBRs. This is just purely looking at a correlation, right? Um, and the countries which had the lowest growth, group four countries, which I, if I can just read off from here, Zimbabwe, Madagascar, and Zambia, also had the lowest improvements in SBRs. And then we did some econometric work. Dirk and I did this. This came out in JDS a couple of years back, the General Development Studies. There's also a chapter in this book. Uh, this was a dynamic panel data regression we did on, on looking at economic growth and found whatever we did with across any controls, across any ton of type of robustness checks, we found the FHA SBRs had a strong positive economic growth, a significant 1% level in most regressions. And the interesting thing was that we, when we also brought in other measures of institutions, the standard measures that are used in the literature, exploration, exploration risk, corruption, those other measures seemed to, seem to lose significance was the SBR measure, which was quite interesting. And also we found, and this is slightly le less uh, robust than the uh, earlier finding, we found that good SBRs, very SBRs, seem to lead to pro poor growth, because we also had data on poverty and growth over this, uh, over this period. Again, Dirk's got a, got a chapter in this book with, uh, with Mahavash Qureshi, uh, looking at, so suppose you are in a country which has good SBRs, and you're a member of, a, of a, the business association. What does it mean for productivity? And so we also looked at micro effects of SBRs. And here we find, interestingly, in the work, the, pa the, pa the paper that Doug's got here, we find the countries which had the best SBRs, me for membership associations get the biggest productivity gains. And that's also interesting. So in a sense, as a firm, if you happen to be in a country with, where SBRs are, are improving or, doing, or, or getting better, you tend to see much more productivity gain of being a member of the association. And actually, this, this particular work we did for also for Indian states with Indian data, we find very similar results. So the Indian case, again, uh, the advantage in India was that, obviously, with India, we have meta-institutions are fixed, rule of law, legal institutions all are fixed. So the problem, again, comparing countries often is, is not the case in India. And in India, also, we know that different states are done different in, uh, differently over time. And the fact that in India, we also have a federal structure where we have significant, significant political economy, a political autonomy of, uh, of Indian states allows us to explore <coughs> sub-national variation in SBR. And that's important, also important. So not only talking about cross-national variations, SBRs in the African case, we're also talking about sub-national variation in SBRs. And again, in Indian states, very quickly, you can see that SBRs evolve very differently. There are states like West Bengal, there's been very little improvement. States like Bihar, that's pretty much flattening out and probably falling off. And the states of Andhra Pradesh, which have shown significant improvement over this period. And Andhra Pradesh is there. So is Tamil Nadu, um, and um, so, so, uh, so is Punjab. So we can see very different variations in a, for the same country within different, state, different parts of India. Same thing we did for India as we did for, for the, as we had done for Africa. This is a paper I did with Max Kelly. It's come out in World Development uh, a couple of years back, uh, and also a chapter in this book, uh, a version of the, of, the, of, the, of the work we did. And here again, we estimated down panel data regressions. Here we could do a lot more in terms of checking for endogeneity concerns, because that's a big issue in institutions literature. That is, the fact that growth is actually leading to better status relations, or, or, or vice versa. We did, we had about a range of controls, and we found strong evidence of the impact of SBRs on growth. The one person increase in our measure, our measure was from zero to one. A one person increase in our measure, this is a three person increase in long run state level growth, which is a very significant effect, actually. Now, finally, the couple, last couple of slides, really. Um, the, the third question was, why is it that we do get to see improvement in SBRs? And we've seen that already in Africa, uh, where we've seen improvement in some countries and not in others. And, and, and in, in the Indian case, what are this? And this is where we essentially the case studies and the political, political scientists uh, did, uh, did a lot of work for us in this, in this project. And of course, there are different things. I'm going to just sort of put this up in one slide. Um, Developing ideologies and goals dominant and political, uh, political economic elites. What do they think about, the, about growth? What do they think about the private sector? Uh, how much is that linked, synchronized with, uh, in, uh, with, a, with, with effective SBRs? That's very important. 
And the second thing that's important is just, the first one is probably pretty, pretty well understood. Nobody will have a problem with that. The second one I think is more interesting in the sense that we do think, and this is where Adrian's, the late Adrian if, if his work is very important, that you can't really have effective SBRs. We think of SBRs being a game, a, rule, a game between two players, the state and the, and the business, business sector, you can't have effective SBRs if the power issues are heavily one-sided. So you have a very state, strong state and a weak private sector if a very strong private sector in a weak state, somebody could get captured. And we know which one will get captured. So symmetry of power is very important here. And we found that in our case studies, that you, essentially you need to have some symmetrical power relations between the state and the private sector. It also matters, and again, I think this has not been discussed so much in the, in the literature, how the bureaucracy is organized is very important, and bureaucratic organization. So not just the IPAs, Investment Promotion Provision Agency, the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Industry, the different uh, public sector organizations that deal with the private sector, like infrastructure corporations, how are they organized, how do they function is very important. Along with that, on the other side, how is the business sector, the private sector organized is also very important. So if you see more than one business association in a country, then we know there's a bit of a problem, particularly if those two associations are trying to speak for the same set of people, same set of firms. So multiplicity, form structure, how is business sector association in, uh, organized, how effective is the organization to communicate to its members? How often does it meet its members? All that we found were very important in explaining effective SPRs. And of course, along with that, formal and informal institutional links with the United States and business, it didn't always have to be through formal, formal institutions. In fact, in the African case, it happened often through informal mechanisms, but we needed to see repeated, as I said, repeated interaction between the state and the business sector for, for effective SPRs. And finally, of course, leadership and human, human agency you do, did see sometimes uh, certain, uh, some certain elites taking a particular role and in interest in this uh, effective SPRs. We saw that, and in fact, I was just going to use the, the Malawi, Mauritius example, but I may not have time. That was very important. But the thing that was important in this work that we found was that getting good SBRs, effective SBRs, is not a techno, tech, 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 uh, technocratic fix. You just can't sort of go and say, I'm going to go try and get good, good SBRs in this country. It essentially came from political processes, <coughs> establishing, sustaining, and renewing effective SBRs was political, or essentially politically determined and could not be had to order. That was very important. So there was a lot of part, de part dependency that came in having good SBRs. I'm going to skip this next two slides because I don't think I have much time. I want to just focus on this, this one slide, couple, last, last couple of slides. First thing is, what does it mean for southern governments, our research? Our research sort of shows, and I think particularly the work that Dirk did uh, with co-authors, including me and others also, that formal organizations and institutions that exist in the IPAs, formalized PPDs, private umbrella, umbrella associations, and enactment competition laws seem to matter for growth. And I think the th way to think about this is that when you set up an IPA, which is functional, or when you set up an eff effective competition law, it's the signaling that you're sending from the state to the private sector that we take you seriously. We take you seriously, we also want to avoid collusive behavior. So the way I think I would see this as a, as a signaling device, more, more than what the IP really does, what the competition law actually does, is a signaling that you're sending, the credible commitment problem you're trying to fix, that gives you the growth, the growth effect. That's the way I would like to see it. Um, and also, if you have effective private sector umbrella associations, um, then, and formalized PPDs, the private sector is able to just convey its legitimate concerns and demands of the state in a transparent and credible manner. Very important to fix collective action problems in the private sector, especially in a context as in African India, where we have very, very dispersed private sector, lots of small players, lots of small firms, and some big firms. If you let the big firms play, do the talking for you, then you have a problem. You've got to find a way to bring in small firms in this intense interaction. For donors, um, what, what does it imply? It implies a different institutional approach to growth that stresses government, private sector relations, interactions, less focus on property rights, less focus on transaction cost minimization that's been there in the literature institutions, and the clear that evidence that we hope we present uh, using this economic work, that these relations and interactions matter for growth. We hope we can convince uh, those who, take, who want to see causal, causal stories that we have a causal effect of SBRs on growth. The other thing I think is important to maintain, keep in mind that we're not talking about just setting up an IPA or setting up trying to get a business association up, up and running. We're talking about brokering the processes which facilitate good SBRs. Uh, and that's very important. And also, given that there was so much suspicion of business associations, certainly in India and perhaps also in Africa, 
you've got to recognize the fact that these institutions can be developmental in the sense that they can actually help in bringing in the private sector um, and actually play a very important role in the development process. In the Indian case, it's very particularly striking because uh, those who have followed Indian economic policy, there was this very strong command and control regime where the, the public, the state, did not really take the private sector association which were there very seriously because a lot of them, in fact, were engaged in significant rent-seeking behavior. And then in the mid-1980s, the state at that time, the, the, the government of the time, uh, decided to start promoting a new association called the Confederation Indian Industry, which was very different. Most composed of engineering firms, not at all like the earlier associations, which were essentially composed of traditional industries. And that in the association played a very important role in brokering good SPRs in India. And there's some good, very good work by Ashima Sinha, not, not through our project, but Ashima Sinha and Stanley Kochanek on that. Um, but the other thing is that we've got to be careful that, you know, the, as, I, as I was saying, that it's not really about trying to create formal organizations. That's not so important. And again, we've seen many times, you've seen business, business, business associations out there who are not really doing their job. We've seen state agencies out there who are not really doing their job. The more important thing is to try and to make sure that the interactions that are there in the business relation, business, business elite actually get strengthened and, and is effective. Okay, thanks, John. Thank you.